morning. So, we are going to start with the remains of the day by Kazuo Ishiguro, who was born in 1954. He was born in Japan, here of Japanese origin and settled in Britain. He attended uh, the University of East Anglia and his uh, debut no novel was A Pale View of the Hills, which was written in 1982. Along with uh, Salman Rushdie, Ian McEwan, Martin Amis and Julian Barnes, he is considered the fabulous four or the fab four of our generation. Mm, he won the Booker for in uh, 1989 for his uh, novel The Remains of the Day, which we are going to do uh, in uh, for the next few classes. Uh, his other works include The Unconsoled, when we were orphans and never let me go, which is considered a kind of a genre bending novel written in 2005 with and it is part sci science fiction and uh, part boarding school memoir. Uh, many critics and reviewers consider never let me go as his best work till date. The remains of the day um, is a particularly important because of the way it has been structured. It is of course, um, Ishiguro had already uh, established his reputation with his debut novel A Pale View of the Hills, but uh, uh, after winning the booker for the remains of the day in 1989, he suddenly shot into the limelight. So, uh, um, and it was also if you if most of you would know perhaps that uh, it was made into a memorable film uh, of the same title, The Remains of the Day. Uh, by uh, It was a Merchant Ivory production starring Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. So, in uh, uh, the novel has three main characters, Mr. Stevens, Miss Canton and Lord Darlington. I will erase this. Mr. Stevens, Miss Canton and Lord Darlington. So, um, Stevens uh, is uh, uh, an old world butler of uh, the of a very famous place of a very famous house rather Darlington house okay, which is owned by Lord Darlington an important uh, political personality as well as a very um, uh, wealthy landowner. So, Mr. Stevens um, whose father also was a butler and uh, he has inherited his uh, father's skills as uh, uh, you know a butler par excellence and he is in the service of Lord Darlington. So, he is our main character as well as our narrator. So, one of the key elements of uh, uh, the remains of the day is the way the story unfolds. Okay. So, the narrator uh, uh, as we consider Mr. Stevens the narrator of the novel, uh, but many people consider Stevens as an unreliable narrator. And why is he considered an unreliable narrator? We will see as the novel unfolds. So, Stevens as we see him today, uh, uh, he is reminiscing on his life and whatever remains of his life. So, therefore, the very poignant title the remains of the day. So, it is not just the day, but the remaining days of Stephen's life. He is an aging butler um, who is motoring across England and this period is 1956, you know a few years after the second world war. So, 
sunset in 1956, but much of the action takes place during uh, the pre second world war era and uh, uh, the immediate years that follow the world war. So, while motoring across England in 1956, we find uh, Stevens reflecting on his life in service all the years that have gone by. So, all the memories come rushing by as he uh, takes a few day uh, uh, a few days off his service. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he, uh, Stevens had served Lord Darlington an English aristocrat with unquestioning loyalty. So, unquestioning loyalty is another theme. of the remains of the day. Loyal to whom and how, uh, to what degree should one remain loyal to one's superior or to one's so called masters, that is also a major motive or major theme of the remains of the day. Um, Stevens is described as a, a person who had uh, uh, an unwavering faith in Lord Darlington's greatness. And what is that greatness? We will soon see. Um, but now, today he lurks in his memories and there are doubts about uh, um, the true nature of Darlington's greatness. And he also starts questioning uh, his own faith in the man he once served so faithfully. So, therefore, the novel is a nostalgic piece. He, re he reminisces and also he looks back with a tinge of sorrow and with a hint of regret. So, um, coming back to the major themes of the novel, what we can say is uh, one major and recurring theme is that of emotional repression. We have already seen that it is also a story of unquestioning loyalty. Um, Ishiguro is also concerned with how public image or how public world impinges upon private selves, the way you cons conduct yourself in public and the way you are actually uh, in a private life. So, how do these collide? How do these two worlds um, collapse into each other? Uh, the remains of the day is also a story of tragic self deceptions and self just justifications. So, uh, when we talk about why is Stephen such an unreliable narrator is because he, uh, he is a combination of all these traits. He is emotionally repressed, he is self deceptive and he keeps, him, uh, keeps justifying himself throughout the novel. And therefore, his reliability as a narrator has often been questioned. Uh, one uh, particular characteristic of Stevens uh, uh, role is the values he represents. Okay. And uh, this has often been uh, taken as a hallmark of Ishiguro's writing. He says a lot. Uh, uh, within uh, a very limited space. So, um, he compresses, but he also suggests a, a lot. So, what we find in Stevens characters are the values he represents and what are those values? First, knowing one's place in a social hierarchy and when we talk about having unquestioning loyalty towards one superior, that means that we are great believers in the ideals or in the ideas of social hierarchy. Um, uh, Ishiguro through Stevens also questions one's belief in great, in the so called great leaders. And remember, we are talking about uh, 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 the period uh, of the second world war and the few years preceding the second world war. And then of course, uh, uh, the unquestioning loyalty to authority. So, all these serve the anti-democratic political tendencies of the time in which the remains of the day is set. 
So, the novel can be read as a book of nostalgia and memory, an exploration of the relationship of the ordinary people to politics and diagnosing the social and psychological conditions in which fascism can take root and thrive. The setting is England and uh, the key places that uh, uh, Ishiguro uh, takes us to are uh, of course, Darlington Hall where most of the action is uh, uh, focused, then Salisbury, Dorset, Somerset, Devon, Cornwall and Weymouth. So, all these are um, uh, places in England and we come across these places as Stephen Stevens motors through the countryside. Now, uh, one important or one uh, uh, major thing about uh, the remains of the day is the way Ishiguro, Ishiguro chapterizes the novel. So, it begins with the prologue and the prologue is uh, its title as prologue July 1956 Darlington Hall. That means, we are uh, from the beginning we are told that uh, which were the specific uh, era and the specific time, uh, specific space and place of the novel, the setting of the novel. Then we have day one as Stevens starts motoring through the British English countryside. So, we have evening Salisbury, day one, day two morning Salisbury, day two again afternoon Mortimer Pond in Dorset day 3 morning Taunton, Somerset, day 3 evening Moscombe near uh, Tavistock, Devon, mm, day 4 afternoon Little Compton, Cornwall and day 6 uh, just notice that day 5 is missing, day 6 evening Weymouth. Okay. So, these this is the way he uh, constructs or structures the novel. Now, when we look at, uh, at uh, uh, chapterization like this, um, what impression do we get? We get the impression that uh, perhaps the novel begins at a place called Darlington Hall, but uh, it is spread over a period of uh, 5 or 6 days and the action is centered on all these places you know uh, which I mentioned here, but it is not this is not the way the action actually takes place. The novel rather is deceptively titled and deceptively chapterized. So, although it alludes to certain days and places and raises expectations of a record of events that uh, occurred on specific days at a specific uh, um, places much like a diary, it looks it gives the impression of, uh, of a memoir, of a diary. However, the balance tilts heavily in favor of Darlington Hall. Almost all action takes place here. Okay. So, it is actually is Mr. Stevens memories of Darlington Hall from all those years ago. So, in a way Stevens six day motor travel through the English countryside turns into a time travel and becomes a journey of memories. What actually uh, what we actually find is a review of what his life has amounted for him. So, as we find narration of occurrences in the present and description of the scenic delights of the countryside, um, we feel that uh, less narrative space is occupied in these place, uh, places and more in the re remembrance of the past. Okay. So, Stevens is a man who remains in the past and he looks back uh, uh, towards his past as his life comes uh, to an end. I would like you to uh, uh, look at the very opening paragraph of the remains of the day. Um, and just see this is the prologue Darlington Hall July 1956. It seems increasingly likely that I really will undertake the expedition that has been preoccupying my imagination now for some days. 
an expedition I should say, which I will undertake alone in the comfort of Mr. Faraday's Ford, an expedition which as I foresee it will take me through much of the finest countryside of England to the west country and may keep me away from Darlington Hall for as much as five or six days. The idea of such a journey came about, I should point out, from a most kind suggestion put to me by Mr. Faraday himself one afternoon almost a fortnight ago, when I had been dusting the portraits in the library. In fact, as I recall, I was up on the step ladder dusting the portrait of uh, uh, Viscount Weatherby when my employer had entered carrying a few volumes which he presumably wished to return to the shelves. On seeing my person, he took the opportunity to inform me that he had just that moment finalized plans to return to the United States for a period of five weeks between August and September. Having made this announcement, my employer put his volumes down on a table, seated himself on the chair lounge and stretched out um, his legs. It was then, gazing up at me, that he said, You realize, Stevens, I do not expect you to be locked up here in this house all the time I am away. Why do not you take the car and drive off somewhere for a few days? You look like you could make use of a break. You could make good use of a break. Now, um, uh, uh, this is a prologue. And we are told that uh, this, uh, uh, when, when Stevens is narrating this particular incident, it seems increasingly likely that I really will undertake the expedition. Um, he is also telling us uh, about an event which happened fortnight ago, where his uh, current employer, uh, we have been talking about Lord Darlington, who owns the Darlington Hall, but now we are told that the current owner of the Darlington Hall is one Mr. Faraday. So, uh, notice this, Mr. Faraday and Lord Darlington. So, definitely Mr. Faraday um, is not uh, a distinguished personage, at least in, um, uh, of course, you know, it, it, lot of it depends on the social hierarchy in England. And, uh, uh, Mr. Faraday, being an American, he is uh, he cannot be given the title of a lord. Okay, but he is an American, and now he is the current uh, owner of Darlington Hall. We are told, and all all these things have happened. He uh, Stevens has been approached by uh, uh, Mr. Faraday while he was dusting um, the portraits, and he was once asked. He was asked whether he would should be or uh, he would like to go on an expedition to the English countryside. And while uh, uh, here I would like to draw your attention that uh, this technique of uh, narrating an incident um, beginning at one point and, and taking us back, um, it, it is very common in uh, literature. We are talking about uh, uh, Gerard Jennett's theory of order and duration here. We are looking at a technique which has already. Uh, we are looking at a, a at a particular incident which has already occurred, and Mr. Stevens is reflecting on whatever has already occurred. Okay, so um, how the uh, novel is ordered and uh, how the novelist uh, constructs uh, or employs the uh, technique of duration. That's what we are seeing here. Okay, um, from here I would like to uh, take you to um, Mr. Stevens' opinion on the question of what is a great butler. See, throughout uh, when I was introducing the novel to you, we were talking about uh, the idea of knowing one's place in a social hierarchy and belief in great leaders, of course, and unquestioning loyalty to, towards authority. So. The question, what is a great butler, that actually arises in the novel, and Stevens, who prides himself on being um, a perfect butler, he um, tries to respond to this. So, this is what he says, to the best of my knowledge, for all the talk this question has in engendered over the years, there have been very few attempts within the profession 
to formulate an official answer, the only instance that comes to mind is the attempts of the Hayes Society to devise criteria for membership. You may not be aware of the Hayes Society, for few talk of it these days. But in the 20s and the early 30s, it exerted a considerable influence over much of London and the home counties. In fact, many felt its power had become too great and thought it, ha, uh, it no bad thing when it was forced to close, I believe in 1932 or 1933. The Hayes Society claimed to admit butlers of, and in, it is in uh, open uh, inverted commas, only the very first rank. So, when we talk about social hierarchy, belief in the so called um, uh, stratifications and ranks in society, then um, there are very few countries that can beat England and here we find a very good example of uh, uh, how the idea of stratifications um, permeates down uh, from top to bottom. So, there are, there are rankings even among the butlers and what the, the, the only criteria for uh, getting a membership to this Hayes society was uh, it, it will but admit butlers of only the very first rank. Now, what is the very first rank? Much of the power and prestige it went on to gain derived from the fact that unlike other such organizations which have come and gone, it managed to keep its numbers extremely low, thus giving this claim some credibility. Okay, so, uh, it was like uh, very difficult to get membership to the Hayes Society, because they would admit people only uh, who were uh, the so called first rank butlers and therefore, the membership was extremely um, difficult to get and uh, naturally there were very few members. Membership it was said never at any point rose above 30 and much of the time remained closer to 9 or 10. This and the fact that Hay Society tended to be a rather secretive body, lent it much mystique for a time, ensuring that the pronouncements it occasionally issued on professional matters was received as though when on tablets of stone. So, it was like 10 commandments. The reference here is uh, to uh, Moses's 10 commandments, uh, you know, uh, 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 professional. Uh, uh, certain you know uh, sayings which are uh, engraved on stone which cannot be challenged. So, we are talking about that kind of uh, society, but one matter the society resisted pronouncing on for some time was the question of its own criteria for membership. Pressure to have these announced steadily mounted and in response to a series of letters published in a quarterly for the gentleman's gentleman. The society admitted that the that a prerequisite for membership was that an applicant be attached to a distinguished household. Though of course, the society went on, this by itself is far from sufficient to satisfy requirements. It was made clear furthermore, that the society did not regard the houses of businessmen or the newly rich as distinguished. And in my opinion, this piece of outdated thinking crucially undermined any serious authority the society may have achieved to arbitrate on standards in our profession. So, who are the people who are not considered uh, first rank households? Um, the newly rich and uh, 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 businessmen. So, one has to be uh, a, bo uh, a born aristocrat and how do you define that? And that, that was the job of uh, the society. So, they would accept only those people who were in the service of the really distinguished and the really uh, aristocratic households. So, it naturally you know, tall demands and it was very difficult to get in. In response to further letters in a quarterly, the society justified it is, its stance by saying that while it accepted some correspondence views that certain butlers of excellent quality were to be found in the houses of businessmen, 
the assumption had to be that the houses of true ladies and gentlemen would not refrain long from acquiring the services of any such persons. One had to be guided by the judgment of the true ladies and gentlemen, argued the society, or else we may as well adopt the prop uh, proprieties of Bolshevik Russia. So, you see England is really sophisticated, whereas Russia is not uh, perhaps it is a country uh, of uh, no very common people. This provoked further controversy and the pressure of letters continued to build up urging the society to declare more fully its membership criteria. In the end it was revealed in a brief letter to a quarterly that in the view of the society and I will try and quote accurately from memory, the most crucial criterion is that the applicant be possessed of a dignity in keeping with his position. No applicant will satisfy requirements whatever his level of accomplishments otherwise uh, if, seem, if seen to fall short in this respect. For all my lack of enthusiasm for the Hayes society, it is my belief that this particular pronouncement at least was founded on a significant truth. If one looks at these persons we agree are great butlers, if one looks at say Mr. Marshall or Mr. Lane, it does seem to me that the factor which distinguishes them from those butlers who are mere extremely competent is most closely captured by this word dignity. And what is dignity, what is true dignity uh, according to Mr. Stevens is again um, exhibiting grace under pressure, exhibiting unquestioning loyalty uh, to um, the masters and uh, knowing their place in the social hierarchy. And what Ishiguro does in the remains of the day is question these uh, uh, um, stagnated beliefs. What happens to a society when uh, its people themselves believe unquestioningly in the greatness of their leaders. What happens uh, to a society when people uh, keep their opinions to themselves because they have an unflinching faith uh, in their uh, in the the so called uh, upper in their upper crust, crust of society. What happens and that that the, according to Ishiguro uh, there is trouble ahead if we encourage these tendencies. And now, I will take you to the place when we find the uh, uh, other important character um, from the remains of the day and which is uh, Miss Kenton. Okay. So, uh, Miss Kenton is uh, one of the housekeepers who is employed by Mr. Stevens. See, Mr. Stevens is a butler his uh, duties include uh, taking care of Lord Darlington's uh, personal needs and also running the household very efficiently, so that the master is not disturbed with the uh, you know day to day problems of running the household. And uh, um, another important fact is, is uh, that uh, there is no lady in the house, so uh, the entire household is run uh, on the strength of Mr. Stevens and an army of servants. I mean, we have a big list of servants who are employed uh, by Mr. Stevens to uh, work in very diligently in uh, the Darlington Hall. And Miss Canton is the housekeeper who has recently been recruited by Mr. Stevens. And <coughs> the moment we see Mr. S uh, Miss uh, Canton um, we meet Miss uh, uh, Canton, we know that she is everything that, uh, 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 that Stevens is not. And uh, there, therein lies the conflict in this story, because these two are poles opposite. Okay. One is total order that is Mr. E, uh, Mr. Stevens and Miss Canton is uh, uh, quite a rebel, she questions, she interrogates. She is not the one who takes things um, uh, lying down and therefore, much of this story is about uh, the conflict 
between these very strong characters, Mr. Stevens and Miss Kenton. Um, before we meet uh, Miss Kenton, uh, we will go to this past place. Uh, this is uh, the chapter is day two morning in Salisbury. Mr. Stevens uh, wakes up uh, in a small hotel in Salisbury and says, strange beds have rarely agreed with me and after only a short spell of somewhat troubled slumber, I awoke an hour or so ago. It was then still dark and knowing I had a full day's motoring ahead of me, I made an attempt to return to sleep. This proved futile and when I decided eventually to rise, it was still so dark that I was obliged to turn on the electric light in order to shave at the sink in the corner. But when having finished, I switched it off again, I could see early daylight at the edges of the curtains. When I parted them just a moment ago, the light outside was very pale and something of a mist was affecting my view of the baker's shop and chemist's opposite. Indeed, following the street further along to where it runs over the little round bagged bridge, I could see the mist rising from the river, obscuring almost entirely one of the bridge posts. Now, in these quiet moments, as I wait for the world about to awake, I find myself going over in mind again passages from Miss Kenton's letter. Incidentally, I should before now have explained myself as regards my referring to Miss Kenton. Miss Kenton is properly speaking Mrs. Ben. So, now we are told that uh, uh, Miss Kenton left Darlington Hall years ago uh, to get married and she is now Mrs. Ben. Mr. Stevens has recently received a letter from uh, Miss Kenton that she would be receiving him at uh, one of the countryside inns and uh, this was all the more reason to, um, uh, for Mr. Stevens to leave uh, Darlington Hall and uh, drive down to the place, because he is, uh, he was uh, indeed quite fond of Miss Kenton and he would like to meet her again. Miss Kenton is properly speaking Mrs. Ben and has been for 20 years, so she has been married for 20 years. However, because I knew her at close quarters only during her maiden years and have not seen her own uh, once since she went to the west country to become Mrs. Ben, you will perhaps excuse my impropriety in referring to her as I knew her and in my mind have continued to call her throughout these years. Of course, her letter has given me an extra cause to continue thinking of her as Miss Kenton, since it would seem sadly that her marriage is finally to come to an end. The letter does not make specific the details of the matter as one would hardly expect it to do, but Miss Canton states unambiguously that she has now in fact taken the step of moving out of Mr. Ben's house in Helston and is presently lodging uh, with an acquaintance in the nearby village of Little Compton. It is of course tragic that her marriage is now ending in failure. Okay, so, when we are talking about day 1 and day 2 and day 3, um, this is the place day 4, afternoon Little Compton, Cornwall and this is where um, the much anticipated meeting of Mr. Stevens and Miss Kenton, now Mrs. Ben is going to take place after about 20 years and whatever Mr. Stevens um, may admit to himself, he is actually looking forward to meet, meeting Miss Kenton. At this very moment, no doubt, she is pondering with regret decisions uh, made, uh, sorry, with regret decisions made in the far off past that have now left her deep in middle age, so alone and desolate. And it is easy to see how in such a frame of mind, the thought of returning to Darlington Hall would be a great comfort to her. Admittedly, she does not at any point in her letter state explicitly her desire to return, but that is the unmistakable message conveyed by the general nuance of many of the passages imbued as they are with a deep nostalgia for her days at Darlington Hall. 
Of course, Miss Canton cannot hope by returning at this stage ever to retrieve those lost years and it will be my first duty to impress this upon her when we meet. I will have to point out how different things are now that the days of working with a grand staff at once beck and call will probably never return within our lifetime. But then Miss Kenton is an intelligent woman and she will have already realized these things. Indeed, all in all, I cannot see why the option of her returning to Darlington Hall and seeing out her working years there should not offer a very genuine consolation to a life that has come to be so do dominated by a sense of waste. Now, this is uh, very interesting and also um, when we refer to Stevens as a very unreliable narrator. Now, see, he admits that nowhere does Miss Kenton or Mrs. Ben uh, express any desire to return to the Darlington Hall. He infers from his letter and we do not know why. He just, uh, uh, he reads between the lines that uh, uh, Miss uh, Kenton or Mrs. Ben is extremely eager to come back to Darlington Hall. He infers from her letter that her marriage is coming to an end and he also just deduces for some no particular reason that uh, um, she is extremely regretful of her marriage and would like to get her job back. And then of course, he has his uh, uh, being still being the you know uh, the head butler of the house. He feels that it would be his um, sacred duty to educate Miss Canton that things are not what they used to be once. So the, the glorious days are over. So while he thinks about the days gone by, while he revels in nostalgia and the grand memories of uh, um, Darlington Hall and its grand people and the glorious days which will never come back. Uh, in these memories, we find that it is not just uh, that he regrets um, the absence of uh, Miss Kenton, but he also uh, mourns the loss of those days. He is actually, he is uh, in fact a kind of man who longs for those days. He is extremely nostalgic about those days and therefore, it makes him a very unreliable narrator. Is Miss Kenton really looking forward to coming back to uh, Darlington Hall? Is her marriage actually breaking? Uh, that we will know only once we ac meet Miss Kenton. But uh, um, as uh, we already know, Stevens is not a very reliable narrator. We will go on to page 58 when uh, and the chapter is still the same chapter, day 2 morning Salisbury and as, as we were discussing at the beginning of uh, this class that although um, Ishiguro titles the chapters uh, in uh, according to various days and various places, the action actually takes place uh, majorly in Darlington Hall. So, while he is uh, uh, reminiscing about Darlington Hall and Miss Kenton, while he is in Salisbury, we are suddenly transported to Darlington Hall. And when uh, the young and re a rather rebellious Miss Kenton confronts Mr. Stevens, who is extremely straight jacketed and uh, very staid in his outlook. Uh, so, now this scene or rather this passage is on page 57. Uh, I am reading you uh, uh, lines by Miss Kenton and Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens, I have just noticed something outside which puzzles me. What is that Miss Kenton? Uh, was it his lordship's wish that the Chinaman on the upstairs landing should be exchanged with the one outside this door? The Chinaman, Miss Kenton? Yes, Mr. Stevens, the Chinaman normally on the landing you will now find outside this door. I fear, Miss Kenton, that you are a little confused.
I do not believe I am confused at all, Mr. Stevens. I make it my business to acquaint myself with where objects properly belong in a house. The Chinamen, I would suppose, were polished by someone, then replaced incorrectly. If you are a skeptical Mr. Stevens, perhaps you will care to step out here and observe for yourself. Miss Canton, I am occupied at present. But Mr. Stevens, you do not appear to believe what I am saying. I am thus asking you to step outside this door and see for yourself. Miss Canton, I am busy just now and will attend to the matter shortly. It is hardly one of urgency. You accept then, Mr. Stevens, that I am not in error on this point. I will accept nothing of the sort, Miss Canton, until I have had a chance to deal with the matter. However, I am occupied at present. So, look at the confrontation, look at the bickering between the two principles. She insists that he come down and look at the, uh, the positioning of uh, uh, this figurine himself. And uh, Mr. Stevens uh, is quite convinced that Miss Canton is uh, uh, correct and therefore, he is not willing to face that uh, there has been a lapse in the household. Because remember, he prides himself on being uh, on his exactness, on his uh, uh, being a perfect uh, butler, and now he knows that uh, Miss Canton has uh, somehow uh, uh, caught a very trivial, a very minor um, uh, mistake in the running of the household. The statue has been uh, placed in a wrong way. And for Miss, she makes a big deal out of it because um, this is her way of uh, um, hitting out at Mr. Stevens, who demands perfection. So, in her own uh, little way, she is trying to tell Mr. Stevens that it's not always possible to be so perfect. You accept then, Mr. Stevens, that I am um, not in error on this point. I will accept nothing of the sort. So, he is not the kind of man who would accept uh, his faults, until I have had a chance to deal with the matter. However, I am occupied at present. I turned back to my business, but Miss Canton remained in the doorway observing me. Eventually, she said, I can see you will be finished very shortly, Mr. Stevens. I will await you outside, so that this matter may be finalized when you come out. Miss Canton, I believe you are according this matter an urgency it hardly merits. But Miss Canton had departed and sure enough, as I continued with my work, an occasional footstep or some other sound would serve to remind me she was still there outside the door. I will skip a few lines and I will uh, come to the point. Mr. Stevens, that is the incorrect Chinaman, would you not agree? She, so, she points it out. Miss Canton, I am very busy. I am surprised you have nothing better to do than stand in corridors all day. Mr. Stevens, is that the correct Chinaman or is it not? Miss Canton, I would ask you to keep your voice down. And I would ask you, Mr. Stevens, to turn around and look at that Chinaman. Miss Canton, please keep your voice down. What would employees below think to hear us shouting at the top? of our voices about what is and what is not the correct Chinaman. The fact is, Mr. Stevens, all the Chinamen in this house have been dirty for some time, and now they are in incorrect positions. Miss Canton, you are being very ridiculous. Now, if you will be so good as to let me pass. Mr. Stevens, will you kindly look at the Chinaman behind you? If it is so important to you, Miss Canton, I will allow that. The Chinaman behind me may well be incorrectly situated, but I must say, I am at some loss as to why you should be so concerned with these most trivial of errors. These errors may be trivial in themselves, Mr. Stevens, but you must yourself realize their larger significance. Miss Kenton, I do not understand you. Now, if you would kindly allow me to pass. The fact is, Mr. Stevens. Your father is entrusted with far more than a man of his 
age can cope with. So, now we are in, introduced to another character, Mr. Stevens father, the old Mr. Stevens or um, Mr. Stevens the senior and who, who was a great butler in his own days. But and uh, if you remember in at the beginning we were talking about what defines or what makes a great butler and for uh, our hero Stevens, his father Stevens senior made uh, for the perfect butler, the, a great butler because he had that elusive quality, um, a quality which cannot be exactly defined, you know the so called idea of dignity. What is dignity and what is dignity in a butler, but uh, both uh, Stevens senior and junior they pride themselves on possessing this quality and they uh, regard themselves as great butlers. So, now we find that old Mr. But, uh, Stevens, uh, the aging butler, he is get he is getting very old, and but he is still employed in some capacity by Mr. Stevens uh, Junior. Uh, so the son has employed his son, uh, sorry, his father in some capacity, and the father still takes great pride in uh, managing the household. He in assisting his son, he also takes great pride in his son's so called success because being a successful butler in such a great house is a hallmark of uh, 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 great prestige and they all revel in it. But what we find is that what Miss Kenton is trying to point at is that old Mr. Stevens is uh, getting along in years and he is not capable of carrying out his responsibilities in such a uh, demanding uh, workplace. And um, what she is suggesting is that uh, Mr. Stevens should uh, uh, burden his father less with the household duties. Miss Kenton, you clearly have little idea of what you are suggesting. So, he is outraged the very idea that his, uh, uh, his uh, choice uh, or, or rather you, you know his position has been questioned because remember we are talking about hierarchies it is Lord Darlington's house, uh, but uh, next to Lord Darlington it is Stevens who rules the place being the head butler and uh, a housekeeper that is Miss Kenton her uh, social hierarchy or her position is definitely lower than Mr. Stevens and therefore, she is not supposed to question him that is the idea, but she does because she is that kind of a person. Whatever your father was once Mr. Stevens, his powers are now greatly diminished. This is what these trivial errors as you call them really signify and if you do not heed them, it will not be long before your father commits an error of major proportion. So, she is cautioning him, although she is very brusque and very harsh, but she is also a compassionate person and she, she makes it a point to draw uh, Mr. Stevens attention to the fact that his father is not what he used to be. Okay, so, they should stop living in the past. Miss Kenton, you are merely looking making yourself look very foolish. I am sorry Mr. Stevens, but I must go on. I believe there are many duties your father should now be relieved of. He should not for one be asked to go on carrying heavily laden trays. The way his hands tremble as he carries them into dinner is nothing short of alarming. It is surely only a matter of time before a tray falls from his hands on to a lady or gentleman's lap. And furthermore, Mr. Stevens, and I am very sorry to say this, I have noticed your father's nose. Have you indeed, Miss Kenton? I regret to say I have, Mr. Stevens. The evening before last, I watched your father proceeding very slowly towards the dining room with his tray and I am afraid I observed clearly a large drop on the end of his nose dangling over the soup bowls. I would not have thought such a style of waiting a great stimulant to appetite. She is being very brusque, she is being rude perhaps, but she is also being very truthful Can truth hurts. Stevens is not willing to accept that his father is way past his prime and Miss Kenton is trying to point out that nothing lasts forever, one should stop living in nostalgia. 
the decline of the great Mr. Stevens, um, the senior, is a very good example that nothing lasts forever and one, one has to stop living in the past. At this point, we will uh, uh, end the class and we will continue tomorrow. Thank you.